I think I can survive anything. That's just my nature. But I never thought I would survive what I went through. I don't think you can blame women for wanting the same thing that, that men have. Um, and I don't think you can blame women for claiming what really was promised to them 25 years ago. It took our gumption, it took us going up there and pounding on the door and saying, you gotta do this. But once we did that, that door opened and the people behind it changed. And they wouldn't have done that had we not had Title IX. Hello, I'm Gina Davis. 25 years ago, Congress passed a law called Title IX, which said that all programs receiving federal money had to provide equal opportunity for women. But laws aren't just ink on paper, and this one altered the landscape of American sport forever. In the next hour, we invite you to meet some of the people whose lives changed course. An Olympic rower who protested naked in an administrator's office. To her, the times are changing. A basketball coach who worked in a room where the furnace blew heat in the summertime. To her, the fight is not over. Male wrestlers who cried after their team was dropped to free money for women's sports. To them, the law has failed. And a team claiming college basketball's national championship. To them, the greatest glory. The times we beat the odds and the expectations, uh, we're reminded always of uh, the promise of Title IX a promise seen through the eyes and victories of the female Olympians who took Atlanta and the world by storm. Yet a promise that in 25 years, uh, Title IX has still not been fully realized. We're reminded of the need to reach out to all girls to tell them that they don't need to be an Olympic athlete to get into the game, that staying active will help them stay strong and stay healthy. When winter freezes the land of 10,000 lakes, Minnesota's heart beats with utmost passion. It was in this heartland of American ice hockey where skating cheerleaders first appeared. Now young girls aspire not to cheer on the boys, but to beat them to the puck. Minnesotans have always grown up with hockey. This is my cousin's autograph, Amber Fricklin, number four. And she was the third best goal scorer in the state. A long time ago, no, like girls couldn't do anything, but now they're doing all sorts of stuff. There, I think it's great that people are doing that. It's really fun. And next year, I think I'm going to play hockey instead of basketball. In 1990, we had maybe 20 girls programs in the state of Minnesota with amateur hockey. This year, we have over 250 girls programs. The high school league sanctioned the sport. The girls realized they had someplace else to go and it gave them the opportunity to say, gee, you deserve to give me a chance on the ice just like you do the boys. They have a high school program, now I do too. A lot of people will look out there and say it looks funny to see the ponytail hanging down their back. Well, to me, it looks funny to watch a boys game now and not see a ponytail. The whole school is behind our team. I mean, it's great when you're walking down the halls and you're like, oh, hey, Lemay, you know, how's it going? It's just great. I mean, hockey's hockey. <laughs> it's cool. It's a testament, I think, to the, the skill level of the girls. People aren't going to come out and just watch hockey if there isn't highly skilled kids. I think that it is truly a, a wonderful opportunity for these girls to be able to compete for their school, have the school pride. I mean, the family and the feeling that you have in the stands today is just unbelievable. And it's girls hockey, but they're just perceiving it as hockey. This is just high school hockey. heard of it I mean it's not something I really thought about before I just went out and played <laughs> and 
think about Title IX when I'm spiking on somebody. <laughs> Although Title IX became law 25 years ago, today only about 10% of big-time college football schools give women an equal chance to play sports. Most universities have more than 100 men on the football team. Because there's no women's football, a school must find other ways to balance the number of male and female athletes to satisfy the law. At Washington State University, the women's rowing teams have more than 100 athletes, helping to offset the football numbers. Plus, an unusual state law in Washington allows the school to direct some tuition money toward women's programs. And the school's administration has shown a positive attitude toward women in sports ever since losing a sex discrimination lawsuit 15 years ago. I recall a, a trip to uh, Canada in which uh, we travel on a uh, small budget and we stayed at a discount hotel. And um, uh, that hotel actually had a, uh, a club that was a, a strip tee uh, club and so when we arrived and you know here were all these young young uh, girls coming out of the station wagons uh, you know headed to the hotel um, the actual clientele thought these were the the dancers you know sport is is a very important part of the larger culture and I think it it's related to what was happening in the larger culture uh, where women um, realized that they should be given opportunities to do what they wanted to do, whether it was in sport or whether it was in business or medicine or law or whatever uh, they chose to be, that they should be able to pursue the interests that they have, the same as, as men were allowed to do. Good. Hi, how was your meeting? It was great. Meet the accidental pioneer a talented athlete from a generation of women who rarely got to show it. Marcia Sainholtz, like many others, turned to teaching. Later, she moved into sports administration. She has fought for a principal, but her stake is also personal. Marcia's daughter now competes in arenas where she never got her turn to play. Yet even as she watches progress, Marcia sees barriers beyond. In administration, the power structure. The women, we talk about this a lot, and um, it's kind of a joke, you know. Every final pool of finalists for an athletic director's position, you have your one woman in a minority and two or three white guys, one of whom gets the job. <laughs> well, I think parents are more encouraging. Um, I think they're getting their daughters involved in physical activity at a, at a much younger age, certainly. I think... Um, they're encouraging their daughters to, to look for those kinds of opportunities. Uh, the public is obviously more supportive. I don't think in some ways women are put down as much as they were in a previous time. Uh, I think people do accept more that you can be athletic and still be feminine. That's really where I spent most of my time was up here in the gym and it was so funny because I was so small. In the gyms it's only, well, the majority were men, like college age men. So I'd be running around on the course, get my rebound or whatever. They'd be bowling me over, you know, get out of the way, get off the court. Okay, let's go paper, scissors, rock. Okay. Ready? How do you do that? Ready? Mm-hmm. You do, oh, you go one, two, three. <laughs> You're so stupid. You won. It was really always sort of part of my makeup. I mean, I've always been really interested in sports, and my parents have always encouraged me to do any kind of sport, all kinds of sports. Rebound, Mom! Why don't you do this in grade? Back in my day, I remember we'd watch the boys, and we'd support them, and we'd think, boy, wouldn't it be fun if we could do that? But it never occurred to us that maybe we had the right to have those opportunities. You rat. That's ten. <laughs> For many success stories, somebody has suffered. Syracuse wrestler and Atlanta Olympian Jason Gleesman has wrestled at home for the last time. The school dropped his program to make room for women's teams. And next, meet two gymnasts who have fought their school in court for six years, looking for their turn to play.